<laughs> wow. Is that the introduction, Sean? <laughs> no, we're waiting for it to roll still. <laughs> It happens. It happens. Uh, welcome to the PHNX Coyotes podcast brought to you by the one and only DraftKings Sportsbook app, America's top rated sportsbook app. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a five star review. I'm Leah Merrill here with Steve Peters and we are very excited today to welcome in our special guest, Michael Grabner, who Coyotes fans know spent the last couple years of his career here, was part of an electric penalty kill unit back then. Welcome to the PHNX Coyotes podcast, Michael Grabner. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having uh, having me. I don't really have much going on, so <laughs> you got the time. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. You're, replacing, you're officially replacing Craig. Actually, that we're announcing today. Yeah, where is he? He's taking his option today. <laughs> I know. I apologize for not being here, but this is a huge upgrade for the show. Having you over, Craig. I'm telling you right now. Yeah, he's been texting me all like the last couple of days. He doesn't even show up. Eh? <laughs> yeah, I know. They got yeah. busy, busy, busy. Work, work, work. Yep. Uh, well, what have you been up to since retirement? You know, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. So what can what have you been up to in the last couple of years? Uh, pretty much the same stuff as now. Uh, I think if you're at the ice, then you might have run into me a few times in the last <laughs> couple of years. So uh, just kind of helped out coaching with my son's team last year as like assistant coach, kind of learning some of the ins and out of youth hockey in the Valley. Um other than that, not really that much, to be honest. Like, yeah, I just became like an Uber driver for the kids, basically, to their <laughs> all their sports or their school and all this stuff. So it's kind of it's kind of been the same the last three four years here, to be honest. So, but that's a full time job, grabs, isn't it? I mean, full time being the being a coach at youth hockey, the amount of time you spend at rinks is absolutely amazing. So you can say you retired, but you're probably at the rink just as much, if not more, than when you played. Yeah, for sure. And like like I said, like it's a full time job driving around the kids and stuff. So it makes you appreciate what the wife did when you were playing, right? So um but yeah, like for hockey coaching and stuff, like you almost think more about hockey now. Like you're trying to structure practices, you're trying to like get ready for meetings. It's like it's a lot of it's a lot of work. Uh it's fun, like it's a different kind of side of hockey for me to learn from, right? Uh, gives you a little bit of an insight of what coaches do on a daily basis. Um, but I think for kids especially, it's at least what I've found for me, trying to always find new ways of like explaining things or what can I do to on the ice to make them understand what I'm trying to get them to do and stuff. So it's not just like pros, right? Adults, you kind of tell them and hopefully they understand, right? They've been around the game long enough. But here it's like, it's almost like a teacher, um, coach, like a mentor role. I guess like a few different components that kind of tie into one here. But I think that's one of the things that you can bring. And I've seen at the ice down a lot from guys that have played in the National Hockey League that go and help in the youth program. Because I think what parents miss that haven't been around sports as much as a professional athlete is I don't want to say they take this youth hockey too serious. I don't want to say it that way. But sometimes it's good to get a perspective from an athlete going, no, no, it's okay. Like we, we can just learn, we can have fun and bring a whole different perspective. I think it's really important. You're not just teaching the kids, you're really teaching the parents too. Yeah, obviously, like I said, I've been around the last couple of years. Um, you get a little bit of insight also of how parents think, what they value what they put like a lot of stock into and stuff, right? And to your point, um, I think we uh, here have a lot of, former players um, helping out with different teams here and, and running like some of my assistant coaches, some of my head coaches. So um, yeah, the thing for me, I always try to keep in mind, right? It's like they're 10 years old, 11 years old. Like the it's they're learning the game, right? Like you can't, I don't know, have expectations like to run breakouts or power plays like an NHL team, for example, right? Like, yeah, you want to try to introduce these things and try to work on it and like, what you said, you should still keep it fun, right? Like, um, I think that's that's like the the middle ground that you're trying to find. Like, keep it fun. How can you make it fun while they're learning it, not just like trying to drill it in their head, right? So, um, that, but that's what I mean. Like, I've learned a lot from different coaches over the last year and a half, kind of seeing 
uh, how they run things, how they run practice, how do they explain things on the ice. Uh, I traveled this summer with my son with a couple of different teams to kind of let him play, but also for me to kind of pick these other coaches' brains and kind of see what, how they how they are around the team and the kids. So, uh, like I said, I, I'm still learning. This is new for me, too. It's not the thing I'm having all the answers, but I'm just kind of trying to soak it all in and, yeah, hopefully put together a decent program. So you've explained this before, but for people who may not know, can you explain, you know, kind of why you decided to step away from the game of hockey at the time when you did? Um, yeah, <clears throat> I don't know. It's this is a tough question. I guess a lot of things that f came together, right? Like at the same time, obviously COVID hit and all these things. So I don't really want to get too much into it. It's it's kind of like. I took a little step back um, when I was around the kids all the time, the family, you kind of saw all this stuff that you missed playing hockey because it is a full year round thing, right? Like you stopped the season. I really took maybe a week off and started training. So it just kind of give you a little bit of a insight of like, okay, I'm missing all these things for the kids' birthdays, the school stuff, like their achievements in sports and stuff, right? So it wasn't just really one thing. It just kind of, yeah, I didn't really want to move again and rip the kids out of environment that they had here, right, and all these things. So like I said, there's a few things. Some might be controversial if I get into them more here. So that's why I kind of just leave it alone. And, like, yeah, it's it's been a great couple of years here, like I said, being around the kids, uh, the team, and, like, um, doing a different thing in life right now. But the good news for you is you didn't have to step away from the rink. I mean, then, and I think for people that have been involved and made their living around a hockey arena, having the ability to still have that outlet, they can still go to the rink. You can still watch hockey. You can still talk hockey. I think that's incredibly important. I know it was in my life where I stepped away and, and I was kind of lost for a little while and having this really brought me back. And I am just glad that I'm still have hockey in your life. And I know you do too. You've talked about with the coaching side. Do you have a new appreciation for coaches now and, and the work they put in and how hard it is to communicate now that you've been on the other side of the bench? Yeah, I think so. Um, to your point. Yeah. Like the first few months, like it was hard too, right? Like you literally had your, your, your days and your months mapped out like every single day you knew you had a day off you knew you had to be at the rink at 10 o'clock and everything so like the first few months was definitely hard till i started helping coaching and kind of got back like into the rink and doing these things so like I've, i know where you're coming from um but yeah the coaching aspect is definitely different because like i said I, i've seen a lot of coaches like go from playing and jumping into assistant roles and i'm like man it's like they seem to forget what happened like last year when they were still playing right they go into the morph into this coaching role um but yeah it is hard like you cannot change a little bit how you look at it right because as a player you obviously have an opinion oh this practice is hard or why are we doing this or this right um but people just trying to figure out like how to help the players right the best way they can how can they make it easy on them to kind of understand what they want you to do um, and obviously, like I said, for kids, it's even, I feel like another level, right? Cause you, you can have all the knowledge you want. Like if you can explain something, what you're trying to say, what you're trying them or what you want them to do, your knowledge is wasted, right? Like, so like I said, there's a lot of people that might know a lot more about me. I'm hoping to try to figure out a way how I can get through to the kids and develop them and have to help them along the way here. So. Now that you have been coaching at this level, do you have the coaching bug at all? Like, do you see yourself being a coach, maybe even at a higher level? Or are you, you know, kind of happy with where you are now coaching at a youth hockey level and just coaching your kids? I think it's still like, I'm still good for now. Like, like I said, once you get to the next levels, it becomes like being a pro again, right? Like, like, I don't know if I ever want to be a head coach. Who knows? Like they deal with a lot of stuff, right? Like they have to do the media stuff and like, you know, it's just like, I don't, again, I've never really sat in on like a coaches, how they plan practice or how much input, um, assistant coach or UPD might have more insight than that. On me. <laughs> yeah. But a big club, but for now it's like fun to kind of get into coaching and kind of like, you know, like being on the ice, explaining drills, like 
it, like I said, you hear probably my voice. We had <clears throat> the first four official practices. Like it's cold out there. You're trying to yell, losing my voice already and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's like I said, it's a different side. So for now, I think I'm good where I am at and trying to kind of learn the learn the use side of things. Oh, I'm going to talk a little bit more of this. I, I'm going to sound like Craig for you for a minute. So people might not know this. Like in the locker room. Michael Grabner is incredibly fit. Like I was around that team for over 20 years. He might be, if he's not the most fit player to ever play there, he's top five. So first of all, if I was Michael Grabner, I'd never wear a shirt like ever. Like <laughs> if I was in public, like why, why would I um, people in our chat? You didn't see this grabs have been wanting us to compare our six pack. We're not going to do that. <laughs> see that a little bit. Yeah. That's not, I'm not going to do that. Cause mine's a six pack of, of four peaks, but knowing how important physical fitness was to you, how important nutrition was to you and taking care of your body and things that, you know, you were, it was important. Is it something that you still look after today, even though you're not going through that professional grind? Um, are you still very mindful of physical fitness and what you eat and your nutrition? Yeah. I'm always trying to work out and stuff. So like that was another thing kind of when you stop playing, I had to kind of find a middle ground, right? Like I used to still work out like, kind of like I was playing like I feel like if I put in like six weeks of work here I could jump back in and play you know what I mean so um but I kind of had to dial it back and find like a different kind of level like so like I I was going through these phases where I took like two months off then I trained again like I was playing I took two months off because that's all I knew right it gets your head and as soon as I stepped in the gym I was going into like the full-on mode so now <laughs> I took a little while off and I started again a couple of weeks ago, kind of trying to find like, I don't even know, like what normal people do, you know what I mean? Like just to stay fit and kind of healthy. Right. And um, obviously eating, yeah, eating is important. I think generally you're trying to teach the kids to um, how to take care of themselves, right. They're starting to be at an age, now. the kids that I coach that they understand like sleep, hydration. Um, they hear it from all sides now too, like from, coaches from their parents right um it's always a big part in in sports um taking care of your body you only have one right it's uh it's yeah it's it's your machine it's your money maker your legs your body so um yeah it's i'm trying to stay up with it just kind of to be an example right like i don't want to be on the ice and not be able to skate so i'm still trying to fly around the ice with the kids and kind of battle them a little bit and like it's a fun thing so um, yeah, you, you try to stay in shape. Um, I think the game has changed a lot too in the last 10, 15 years, right? Like my first year when I got drafted, guys looked a little bit different than now. So it's all becoming about training camp comes and you're ready to go, right? I think yeah. you could probably play two days after training camp started. Like everyone is in physical shape, like to start the season. So um, that you, you never, that, that wasn't always the case, right? So yeah, so physical fitness is definitely a big part in today's game and like just i think in general overall well and, and we talk about you brought up when you go back to the early part of your career you're a first round draft pick you're a 14th overall pick and one of the things if people don't remember michael grabner is your speed you you were probably the not probably you're the fastest guy on the ice most nights when did that start? Like, were you 10 or 12 years old and you were the fastest guy on your youth team? Or just as you got older, you go, oh, my gosh, I'm faster than everybody else. Like, when did it really hit you that, my goodness, I'm fast? Um, Yeah, I think as I started getting older and youth, probably around 12, 13, 14, I don't know. Like, I just did a lot of different sports. Like, I did a lot of track and field meets in school. Like, in Austria, we had, like, meets between schools where I did, like, sprints, um, long jumps, um, I played a lot of beach volleyball in summers. So I feel like, like, like I was trying to look back, right? When people ask me a question all the time, like, how did you get that fast? What did you do? And I'm like, there's not really a specific thing that I can point to. Like, I never really had a skating coach. I never had, never really even worked out. Like, back to your point, like, it was like, hey, do squats, do bench press, and, like, yep. go run a mile, right? Like, that's the workout yeah. back then. So, um, it just, I feel like just being active, doing different kind of stuff, like, Unco like subconsciously kind of build all the fast twitch muscles like i said i used to be at the lake six eight hours when i was 13 14 with my buddies and we would play beach volleyball like jumping <laughs> all the way sprinting in the sun and uh, saying sorry um i'm sure it builds muscle or fast twitch muscle right but without realizing it so 
I think it's just like it was a combination of a lot of things. And like, yeah, um, some of obviously probably God given talent and luck, whatever you want to call it. So, but again, uh, it, it worked for me. And uh, I think I, I make good of using it. So. Um, I want to ask if you've been watching the World Juniors at all. It's going on right now. Obviously, Austria was in the tournament. Did you follow that along at all? And you have, you know, have you been keeping tabs on just hockey in Austria in general? It's tough. Yeah, I used to. And it's kind of a lot of my buddies are like moved on or out of the league now, like people that I know. So I don't really know too much about hockey back home i haven't been home in three years so i haven't even really spoke to many people back home uh but yeah i followed the world juniors a little bit i think they're on the nhl network all the time so like when i'm at home and not writing practices i'm like oh there's a game on let's turn it on and kind of watch um i watched austria for a little bit because uh my buddy is a goalie coach and i also the other three the head coaches my buddy from my hometown and the other two guys i know from playing with them and stuff so it's kind of crazy to see like five, 10 years ago, I was playing with these guys at the in Sochi at the Olympics and now they are transitioning to coaching um, the national team and stuff. So it's, yeah, I definitely followed them. I think they did pretty well. Um, we have some work to do like in Austria. It's just the way it's always been. We've tried to change certain things around, but uh, a lot of things kind of fell on dead ears. But um, yeah, like, it's starting to come back though and like they're trying to get better i think they had some pretty good showings um we have some talented young guys but they need to get also chances in the austrian league right in the men's league which is usually hard to come by so yeah i don't know if you saw the americans they got some things to work on too but that's a whole nother i watched story. i i came home uh yesterday um and then it was like five minutes left or something and i've watched it they were dominant last five check was hanging on there but but I think, I guess they had a slow start or tough something. Tough start. Yep, they had a tough start. Couldn't get their legs going. Couldn't get through the blue lines. But go back to, again, your early career. And people, again, when you, when you were here, you were a penalty kill specialist. Like you were, you know, six shorthanded goals. With This team was first in penalty kill in the National Hockey League. But when you first broke in your first two full seasons in the National Hockey League with the Islanders, you scored 34 goals your first year, 20 goals your second year. And we talked about how important the 20 goal plateau is here on this show often. 20 goals is a big deal. You're a goal scorer. When did you go from goal scorer to penalty kill specialist? Or were you always both? Like when, when or did your career evolve as you got older and smarter? Um, I think multiple things happen. To your point, though, like I think 20 goals, if you're any kind of goal scorer, if you break it down a little bit, which I tried to do when I was in juniors, which I tried to do when I was in the AHL and an NHL, it shouldn't be hard to do. Like I know 20 goals is a lot and like, that's a good number, right? It's every fourth goal. That's how I treated it. I broke it down to, okay, I need 20 goals. That's every fourth game I go. So some games you get two goals, then you have like more wiggle room, right? To get six goals, six game break to get one. It's just like people put so much pressure on scoring all the time that like they fall into these like slumps where they don't score for a longer period of time, right? Um, but yeah, I got drafted as a goal scorer. I always considered myself a goal scorer <clears throat> um, till I got traded and then put, picked up by the Islanders, right? And that's where they kind of turned me into a penalty killer. Like I penalty killed in juniors, but never really in the HL for two years. I played there and just just power play. I was even like at the point one time <laughs> running a power play. So, but I, what a lot of people don't realize is I feel like a lot of these young kids getting drafted that, that scored 30 goals, 40 goals in juniors, right? They expect to do the same thing in a AHL or NHL, but there's only six spots in the top six. So if you got drafted at my time to Pittsburgh or Chicago, like you were not getting in there in the, yeah. in the top six. So either you figure out a way that you can still be valuable to the team and kind of revamp your game, as you said, or you're going to go to Europe or be in HL, you know, like it's just, and so I feel like a lot of people have problems with that. They, they, they see themselves as a goal scorer and then they, they're not giving power play. They're not giving the top six role and their, their career kind of fizzles out. Right. So where I kind of like, they gave me the penalty kill role. I still was scoring goals. I obviously wanted to score goals. It's fun. <laughs> but I just was okay. I'm going to try to be and do the best I can here and just kind of figure out. And it became kind of like, a, like you said, a, a specialist in that 
in that in in that specific field. So, um, and then yeah, and I just kind of revamped my game because I remember my draft video going back. If you listen to this, uh, I think it's Dragger saying, "Oh, he's a one-dimensional offensive wow. forward," and then I turn into like more of a defensive-minded, like penalty killing kind of guy, right? So. Um, again, this is just what I try to tell young kids when they ask me is like, Hey, just try to do what the coaches tell you. If they want you to penalty kill, penalty kill, figure out a way how to get good at it. You know, like it's, there's only certain roles on a team. You want to have certain amount of slots. So, um, I think that's probably the biggest advice I have for kids in general. They always ask me parents, like what advice? I'm like, just try to do what the coach tells you. Like sometimes you might not agree with it. But if you don't agree with it and you don't do it, you're going to be off the team. So that's just how it works. Looking back at your NHL career as a whole and even your time with the Coyotes, what are some of your like best memories from either your NHL career or your time in Arizona? That's another question that I, uh, I hate. It's like, you know, <laughs> go, Leah. David, no, I'm like, oh, for one? five in my questions today. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just like, <laughs> I had this question, like, what's your favorite moment playing for that team? I'm like, I played yeah. five years. There's a lot of great moments. It's yeah. tough to pick out one, right? Like if you would have won a Stanley Cup with one team or something, right? With, with the Coyotes, it was probably, even though I didn't enjoy the bubble as much, but being in the playoffs, right? Competing with the Coyotes, being in the playoffs for the first time in a long time, right? There was some excitement, yeah. right? So, like, that would probably be one, right? Uh, but it's, like, always tough to pick out, like, so, like, the, the Winter Classic was fun to play wow. at. Um, being the first game in the, in the playoffs um, with the Islanders back in, like, the Pittsburgh game, like, that was one of the loudest atmospheres I've ever played at in the U.S. Like, it was incredible. Um, so, like, there's a lot of memories that pop out. Like, again, if I would have won a Stanley Cup or something, <laughs> that would have probably been the top of all of it. So... Because all the individual achievements, yeah, they're they're great. Again, like I still, still regret never winning a Stanley Cup. Well, it's we talk about a lot of things, a lot of memories here. There are going to be some new memories here in Arizona, and you know it. And you read the news, and you've got Twitter. <sighs> the Coyotes are moving, and they're moving <laughs> to ASU. They're going back to school. It just I, I've asked everybody that we've had on the show over the last few months because there's this perception that this is such a bad thing and all oh, this is bad for hockey and it's bad for the NHL. And I've been to the building. It's going to be a beautiful building. What are your personal thoughts on an NHL team, the Coyotes, going to play in a 5,000-seat college arena as a player, from a player perspective? Yeah, I've talked to you before about it and – Again, maybe I have a different point of view from coming from Austria and stuff, but do they, will there be obstacles? Sure. I'm sure not everything will be great around it, like the locker rooms, whatever it may be, right? Once you step on the ice as a player, the ice is the same everywhere. The ice will be the same as a Glendale. The ice will be the same the bench you sit there, right? So for me, it all depends on, okay, what are the Coyotes going to do to make this like a great atmosphere for fans, and for players, because like I said, I've played in Europe. I've played in my hometown. When we played our rival team, there was probably 5,500 people in there, but they were jam-packed in there. I don't know how they fit those extra 500 people. And that atmosphere was incredible. You feel like the, the, the fans are on top of you. It's loud. It's like it was a ticket that people wanted to have, right? They were lining up for to get the ticket. And as a player, that gives you – we might not even had the best teams a lot of times, but we you just pushed because it was so fun to play in such a great atmosphere. So like the summer rinks that hold 20,000 people, but in a February game, that's like a random team out from out east or west, wherever you are at the point, there's six, five, 6,000 people in the rink anyways. Like it's not the best atmosphere, right? So for me, it all comes down to what can they do to kind of make it like Vegas, right? Vegas is a great example. Of course, they fill a bigger rink, but when they came in, they, they, everyone wanted to be there. They had a whole spectacle around it, the band and the music and the show, right? And I think that's why they were also good right away because the players fed off that, the, the, the city fed off it. So I think you can make it good, right? Like I said, there was going to be obstacles. It's not going to be perfect. Um, but for me as a player, I would be excited. I'd be like, hey, if we have a full-out barn here, we have like a – whatever a band or like a good atmosphere i would be excited to play again i don't know if i think differently than others but some some guys are just 
very spoiled out there. So, <laughs> yeah, I can think of a few that no, no, no grabs. I just want to say this. You, you are one of the best people I've ever worked with and your positive attitude. You're great to be around. You work hard on and off the ice. I'm, I'm so thrilled you're staying in this community and helping kids learn the game and get better at the game. The, the community of, of Arizona is much better having you in it and helping these kids out. So thank you for taking time out of your really busy schedule right now to talk a little hockey and really hope you do it again because um, we love talking Coyotes hockey here five days a week, right, Leah? Yep. Thank you so much, Michael. We appreciate you coming on and enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Thanks for having me. A nice little break down from my day. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Grabs. Appreciate it. Thank you, you. Thank you. Well, thank you again to Michael Grabner for joining the show. I think I can speak for a lot of Coyotes fans. When I think of him, I think of that unreal penalty kill. It was the, t- it was the kind of penalty kill that when the Coyotes – we're on a penalty kill you were like oh this could be fun instead of oh no another penalty kill yeah like that's just what i think of when i think of he's a guy that when he was on the ice as on the penalty kill you're going oh the Coyotes might actually score here like this could like it's okay to be Mm -hmm. on the shorthanded because michael grabner could make things exciting i tell you what smart player unbelievably fast like ridiculous oh speed gosh, yeah. like one of the fastest players i've ever seen and i, I know mcdavid's got the, the breakaway speed but michael grabner on the ice he was so fast and i talked to him a couple of weeks ago we just sat and had coffee and we talked about his speed and how do you teach that do you get power skating coach he said no i, I was just faster I, I said i don't know you can't teach kids like kids ask me at the ice and all the time how do i get faster i was just faster yeah he's, he's kind of his talent so he's wonderful person um, yeah franchise was, was better off having him so and it was re- it was really interesting too, kind of just his coaching philosophy and how he grew up. It's like, don't overthink it. Just, you know, when a coach tells you to do something, do it. Like just, you know, people now, I think these days they're it's like, what programs do I need to be on to be this player? It's just like, just enjoy the game, have fun, like work hard and it could pay off. So yeah, he's doing it for the right reasons. And he's, he's yeah. you know, it's great that these former Coyote players are around. And I think it's important to see, yep learn the game the right right way. And I think you see it like with a Matthew Nye's playing. And I know we talked world juniors. He's a kid that grew up here because he was around that element of all these, these former NHLers. So I, I'm really glad we had him on and um, I wish him the best of luck in his coaching endeavor yep. at the ice. Den. Yep. Thank you again to Michael Gravner. We got some NHL news to get to, including a big free agent signing that happened today. Before we get there, I will just say, that now with the Nazem Kadri signing with the Calgary Flames, which we'll dive into in just a second, Calgary now has top odds in to win the Stanley Cup at plus 1,800. I think they have the fifth best odds in the NHL on DraftKings. Um, so interesting always to see how moves like that affect the DraftKings Sportsbook app. So if you have some confidence in Calgary, you can bet on them in all sorts of ways. You can also bet on the World Juniors. If anyone bet against Team USA last night, you could have won some cash. So be sure to get in on the DraftKings Sportsbook app. If you haven't already, college football is just around the corner. ASU kicks off two weeks from today, which is unbelievable. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use the promo code PHNX. Bet just $5 on college football and get $200 in free bets instantly. That's code PHNX only at DraftKings Sportsbook. And let's get into the Kadri, the Kadri signing because this is a domino we've kind of been waiting to fall for over a month now. Free agency opened over a month ago. We thought Kadri would go in the first week and it's been cricket since then. Heard rumors of him staying in Colorado, heard rumors of him possibly going to New York. And today, Nazem Kadri signed a seven-year, seven million AAV contract with the Calgary Flames, who have had one of the most dramatic off-seasons I can remember a team having. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a team, as soon as you see the exodus of Goudreau and Kachuk and you go, uh-oh. Brad Trilliving might get fired. This team might not make the playoffs. It's going to blow up. They have their arena, blah, blah, all of these things. And all of a sudden you go, wait a minute, what? So now you got Huber to coming in. You got Weir coming in on the back end. You got people signing to long-term deals. And then you go out and get the top free agent available that people have been waiting for all summer. And I always thought he was going to end up back in, in Colorado. Somehow they'd figure out a way to get it done. I didn't have Calgary on the radar. And, um, I know Craig's mentioned this morning, but Craig's dialed in. I'm not. So he he had talked, saw this coming. I didn't. And and 
for right now, the Calgary Flames, if they're not the favorite in the Pacific, they're neck and neck with it with Edmonton. For me, this is returning a, a couple of, you know, got Lindholm coming back. You got Mangiapane coming back. You're adding Huberto to that. Um, and now you add Kadri, and it's an element. I tell you what, he he plays both ends of the puck. He's a 200 foot player. He can be a little bit of a, a disturber around the net, and he can cause a little havoc. Like it's it's an element that Kachuk brought um, that I thought they might be missing. Well, now they got it again. It's it's going to be interesting. I don't think he'll be it, it, play as an important role as he did with Colorado. I think Colorado probably had more talent, more skill at the higher end than Calgary does. So he's going to have to pick up. You know, he's going to have to be a real important piece. He's going to be an important leadership piece here. But I tell you what, the Calgary Flames, like you said, on DraftKings, like they're they're for real now. And I, I love their goaltending. I think they're they're a threat in the Pacific. Yeah, I just looked up the Pacific Division odds, and they're not there. So DraftKings is obviously currently oh, get, working out. Get on out. the phone. Yeah, they're currently working out the new odds. I'm sure they, they'll take odds down when things change. So they want to make sure they have it correctly up there. So once they're on there, I will check back and let you know what their odds are. Um, and here's a little fun fact. The Colorado Avalanche and the Calgary Flames play on October 13th. It's wow. the Avs' second game of the season. I believe it might be the Flames' home opener. Wow. How about that? Get that excitement going for Cadre against his old club. We'll see what the, Co- the, the, the Colorado Avalanche, we're going to get into this as we get closer to the opening night, but Cadre was a big part of them winning the cup. And, and when he came back from that thumb surgery, ends up getting the, the winning goal in overtime. He was the best player on the ice that night. He was huge in, in taking some of the load off and some of the defensive responsibilities off from some of the higher end players for that team and made you look, hey, we can, we can watch McKinnon, but we better keep our eye on Cadre too. So he... He was a big piece of that team, and having him gone and Kemper gone, I'll, I'll wait and see what ends up happening with Colorado Avalanche. But a huge move for Brad Trilliving in the Calgary Flames. I think it's a great pickup. Um, I'm excited to see what this team can do in the Pacific Division, and, and luckily the Coyotes don't have to play against them that many times. Yeah, uh, the the Colorado Avalanche are the only team currently with minus odds um, to win their division. So pretty much a done deal, according to DraftKings. Wow. And one more note, uh, Calgary did trade Sean Monahan to Montreal to accommodate the Cadre deal today. And that's so. a player they've been trying to get rid of for a while. I mean, Sean Monahan, he got eight goals last year. He was a minus 15. He's, he, I, I think that that's, that's something that was probably, probably um, they're okay with. Yeah. So interesting, interesting moves. It finally happened. Um, so that's exciting. And uh, I can't believe, like, talking about October 13th, it's not that far away. And soon we can just go to Four Peaks, turn, watch a bunch of hockey. I love, like, that feeling when hockey's back on TV, NHL hockey, that is, because we've been watching the World Juniors. And I know I'll be enjoying Four Peaks when I watch hockey. And we'll be at Four Peaks in a little less than two weeks. Four Peaks Wednesdays. The last Wednesday of every month will be there August 31st all day for our live show. So come out and join us um, at Four Peaks. You can enjoy some beers. There's There'll be drink specials. You can have some chicken tenders. And on that day, we'll be announcing our Toast of the Month sweepstakes winner. So if you haven't entered, you have just under two weeks to do so. You can win a $50 Four Peaks gift card, a PHNX shirt of your co- choice and a phnx annual membership go to gophnx.com or click on the link in the show notes you must be 21 or older and enjoy responsibly but you do not have to be 21 to come hang out with us at four peaks on the 31st so and some of the we chicken tenders there oh my god the chicken tenders are just amazing all right world juniors we've touched on it with grabner earlier is that um, still on yeah we talked about it yesterday. Now. We talked to John Rosen. We we asked, are there any upsets in the quarterfinals? He said, probably not. And oh, we were boy. all wrong because oh, Team USA lost to Czechia oh, boy. last night in a shocking loss. That Logan Cooley did score a goal. He actually had a pretty good game. He won all 13 of his face-offs, according to Chris Peters, um, in that game. But... It wasn't enough. They didn't. Did you watch the game? I didn't actually get to watch it, but I just I saw the Twitter highlights. I guess it's, it's hard, and I, and I, I watch a lot of the Twitter comments, and they're from real negative and harsh about the, this team. And the reality is, they're still kids. 
It's it is incredibly difficult to get up for every game in the same way. If that game would have been against Canada in a full building, you'd have seen a different American team. Um, this tournament, they were they were electric. Like they were a very difficult team to play against. They were up and down the ice. They were fast. They were strong. They were dominant. They weren't. The first two periods of this game, they didn't show up. They didn't skate. They didn't move. I don't know if it was preparation. I don't know if they were tired. I don't. I'm not in the room, so I don't know. I can't speak to it. But they didn't show up the first two periods, and it, it's hard to to try to win the game in 20 minutes. And the first five minutes, they were shorthanded of the third because they took a five minute major. Um, it's unfortunate because I think the two best teams in the tournament were the Canadians and the Americans. I would have loved to see that as, as a final matchup for the gold medal. Um, I, I think Canada's path is, I hate to say it, but I think it's fairly easy right now. Uh, I don't see anybody playing as well as the Americans were playing, even though the Americans played poorly as an American and frustrated. I mean, you'd like to see the, the team do better than that. And the good news is, is, is four months from now, they get to do it yep. all over again out in Halifax. Yeah, but it's interesting because the, they just announced the groupings for that. And I think like three of the four winning teams are in the same group. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens in a couple month, months. It's a huge bummer for Team USA. And it's funny because in all my years, and we've talked, everyone we've talked to about the World Juniors, like it is an event in Canada. And I think John Rosen in his interview kind of compared it to how March Madness is in the US. Like it's that level of a cultural impact. So I've always been a Team Canada fan always 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 this is the one year and i think you know kind of the way the city of edmonton is spelled and john rosen also touched on this in our interview with him yesterday but you know it's just like hard to get behind it so for now team usa to lose which i also had the investment in logan cooley um now there's no coyotes prospects left in the tournament unless you want to count connor bedard we can think ahead <laughs> yeah. on the wheel of fantasy exactly. um i'm just not like i just I'm not in it anymore, but uh, Canada will be in it still. So I'll, I'll I'll pay attention. I'll tune in. I'll be interested to see what Bedard does going forward to um, Canada beat Switzerland 6-3. Sweden only beat Latvia 2-1. to one, And that was a barn burn. That was right up until the end in the third. It was a tie that game really in the third really surprised period. me. Latvia. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then obviously yesterday while we were live, Finland beat Germany. So it should be interesting to see how it shakes out. We'll still you know, give updates, but really disappointing. And for team USA, hopefully yeah, I've got they three things to look come for. back better. You're right. Bedard is one. Yeah. What does he do over the next two games? Two can Canada win the gold medal. That's two. And three, do people show up? Like as Canada progresses, do they, do people care? Do people come to the building? So those are the three things I'm looking for. I'm not watching with the same anticipation and excitement as I was going into yesterday oh, i know wow. and, and it's funny because we said oh the crowds will show up for canada versus the usa but now that's not even on the table so yep. we'll see we'll see oh, i hope i hope they do i hope you know for the for the players in the tournament's sake that they get that that crowd and if canada does win gold or gets to the gold medal game they have a good showing it's on a saturday so maybe that'll help but we shall see whatever team you want to rep, Canada, U.S., Coyotes, Suns, D-backs. You can get your gear at foco.com. You can also get bobbleheads. We're today after this show, I'm going into our new office. We're in construction mode. We're building furniture. We're organizing. We have to sort through all of our decorations and that includes our bobbleheads, which a lot of them are broken, so we're going to need to replace them. I'm going to head over to foco.com. That's F-O-C-O.com. They've got you covered with the best Arizona merchandise. They've officially licensed gear for men, women, and kids, and everything from bobbleheads to swimsuits to Crocs. Head on over to foco.com or click the link below in the description. For all non-presale items, use the promo code PHNX for 10% off. It's funny. Somebody in the comments talked about Cooley and and felt bad for Cooley, and we I, I do as well. Now it's going to be interesting to see what Team USA does in preparation for the tournament in December. Like, oh, how many of these players are coming back in a few months um, to do this again? And, and I know Logan Cooley is going to the University of Minnesota. You know, they had three at least three Gophers on this team. Um, is that something that they'll? Are they going, gosh, I can't wait. I, I want to get back at this, put on the Team USA sweater and, and make another crack at it. Does this give them, you know, a little bit of a boost coming into the tournament yeah. in December? We'll see. And I'd love to see Logan Cooley get another crack at it. Um, he was a good player in the tournament. Wasn't a great player. He was a good player. I mean, he, he had 13 faceoffs is great. And he gets the goal driving the net. Great. 
but I'd love to see him be more of an impactful player the next time around. His line was the best line at times with Matthew Nyes. Um, so we'll see what they do coming up in December. I still think his, his path to the NHL is still through the university of Minnesota. Yep. So be patient. Yes. Patience is key for Coyotes fans and Team USA fans. Um, but, and the University of Minnesota will be playing ASU in November, I think around Thanksgiving. Right Thanksgiving so to Friday, if you want to, if you want to see Logan Cooley and Matthew Nyes live in person, you can grab tickets to that, get to experience the arena. If you're not able to get into a Coyotes game, it'll be exciting. We're going to have coverage of all of it, not just Coyotes, but Sun Devils as well. I know the PHNX Sun Devils crew is planning to get out to some hockey games. And so, be sure to just follow along for all of PHNX sports. Become a member at gophnx.com to get access to all of the amazing content behind the paywall. We got video content, written content, and you can also join our members only discord by becoming a member. So sign up for an annual membership. It's the perfect time, the hockey season and basketball and football just around the corner. You can sign up for that annual membership, get a shirt from the PHNX locker like the one PD is wearing right now, or you can try out your first month, just 50 cents. If you want to sign up for month to month, join our members only discord. We have a blast chatting in there daily. And I know Craig has some great stuff coming up this week and tomorrow we will be another guest, another guest three. Have we ever had three Three guests in a row? row? I don't think we have. Unreal. Um, You can go to that other outlet and get coyote. Oh wait, no, you can't. (laughs) It's only here. Um, the new Tucson Roadrunners head coach, Steve Potvin will be joining our show live tomorrow, Friday at 11 AM here on the page next sports YouTube channel. Really excited to chat with him. We've had him on an episode of down the I 10 before, but never as the Roadrunners head coach. So we'll get to ask him about his new gig and what he's looking forward to. And I know he and PD go way back. So looking forward to that interview. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge Steve Potvin fan. He's a good guy. He's a good interview. Um, yeah. So uh, it should be a lot of fun tomorrow. I'm looking forward to seeing what he's got to say about the outlook for next season because we know what the, the outlook is for the Coyotes, or at least yep. we think we do. Um, I'm I'm imagining it's going to be a lot different for what the expectations are coming out of Tucson. I know last year they, they had some injuries and too many call-ups here to make their season incredibly difficult down in Tucson. I'm um, looking forward to hearing what he's got to say going into this year and if they've got higher expectations. Absolutely. Before we head out, I just want to get to one quick question in the chat. Um, and last time I said this, you said that's their name. But yes, super dumb asked, what's the status with Doan? He's NCA for a bit, right? Yes. Yes. I and mean, it depends. Like, it's interesting how this path, he, he's in the right place at the right time. I, I think the college game for Josh Doan right now, he needs to get stronger and he needs to get bigger. And he's getting a lot of reps and a lot of good positions. He's going to be on their power play. He's going to play a lot of important five on five minutes. He is absolutely in the right place at the right time. He's getting great development. He was, he was a guy that was around this USA world junior team um, over the summer getting, didn't quite make it to the final cuts, but he's something that talked about there. Um, look for his name to come up again for, for the tournament in December. Um, he'll be there. I would imagine an, another this year and another one. Um, and who knows, maybe, maybe he graduates from ASU ultimately, but he's going to be at ASU for, for at least this year. And I would anticipate next year. Yep. And good news for us. They're playing in the same building. So super easy to watch him play. Unlike some, you know, players who are uh, up in Canada or colleges across the U S we can watch Josh Stone play here. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for chiming in in the comments. Thank you again to Michael Grabner for his time today. Looking forward to interviewing Steve Potvin tomorrow. Please like this video. Subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review there. Follow PHNX across all social platforms. PHNX underscore sports. We got Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, anything you can think of. We're there. And please follow us on Twitter at PHNX underscore coyotes you can follow me on twitter at leah merrill you can follow pd at s peters hockey you can follow craig at craig s morgan and you can follow sean at sean underscore to pause give him some follows uh, we'll be back live tomorrow at 11 a.m with c poppin until then enjoy the rest of your thursday everyone oh.